And so that you who are not as close to it as we are may know a little more about what it's all about, we have persuaded our favorite cake reader to come. Unlike a tea reader who reads the future, he is going to read Dan's past. And this is Ed Griffin from California. Well, I'm in training for being a mystery guest on What's My Line. I think I'm probably the only cake reader in the free world. <laughs> but I need the practice. I may need a job someday. I have a script here which explains many of the symbols that are on the cake. And you'd never guess what these symbols are all about unless you knew the background. Well, the favorite joke about the communists? Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'll try and give you some of the background on these uh, little symbols and figures. Afterwards, I'm sure some of you will want to come up and take a look at them yourselves. But on the right side of the cake, as you face it, on the second from the top tier, uh, you will find the figure of a small boy on a horse. Now, according to the information which I have here, which comes from a very uh, suspicious source, uh, I'm told that uh, Dan Smoot was born in Jefferson Township, Missouri on October 5th, 1913. And he was the second child of Bernard Smoot, a young Dutch farmer, and Dora Albright, the daughter of a prosperous county landowner. Now he was christened, get this, christened Howard Drummond Smoot. <laughs> but, but he acquired the nickname of Dan while in his teens, and he's used it ever since. And I don't know why he acquired the name of Dan. That's not on the cake, and it's not in the script, but maybe he'll tell us about it. Now, now to the horse. His maternal Dutch grandfather, uh, William Albright, it says here, taught him a lesson on individual responsibility when Dan was only five years of age. According to the script that I have here, Dan nagged his grandfather for permission to ride the old man's prize stallion. Now, I'm not much of a horse rider, but when I think of a, of a big stallion, that's a big critter about this high. And a five-year-old boy would be about this high, and I don't know any five-year-olds that would ever nag their grandfather to ride his big stallion. But anyway, he did, Dan did, and his grandfather wisely resisted the idea for some time, but Dan unwisely persisted until finally his grandfather grabbed him, swung him up on the animal, and slapped it. You can... <laughs> I presume by it we mean the animal. <laughs> it says here that the stallion took off for a three-mile run can you imagine staying on that horse for three miles while the horse jumped several fences before returning to the barn and tossing Dan into a haymow where his grandfather was waiting? <laughs> the old Dutchman looked down and said, quote, I wonder who recorded this anyway. Here's what he said. I hope you learned the lesson. Don't try to do something you aren't man enough to do. And if you do try to do it, then make sure you do it right. And I guess that was a lesson that Dan Smoot learned very, very well. Now, if you go on down the cake, you find another symbol. There's an old woman there and a, a boy next to the old woman. And we're told that this is to remind us of the happy days that Dan had with his grandparents. Um, interesting story here. When Dan was six years old and visiting his grandparents again after that horse ride, I, I'm surprised he went back, but there he was. <laughs> he was probably going to try something else. And he almost did. There was a hired hand there, and according to the story, this old hired hand told Dan that supernatural and limitless powers of the devil could be attained for an entire lifetime by anyone who had the courage to make a pact with the devil through a secret ritual known only, of course, to the hired hand. Well, Dan, at the age of six, figured he, he had the courage 
And I guess he was about ready to try something along those lines when his grandmother caught wind of the whole deal, and she wasn't about to let her grandson loose to the devil, so early at least. And so she got... <laughs> she got hold of young uh, Dan, and uh, as it says here, she rescued him from the devil, and it resulted in a five-hour session on their knees in the kitchen trying to... Uh, cure what damage that might have been done. <laughs> and I presume that there is no question now that five hours was enough. <laughs> Need one more hour, he says. <laughs> so that was Dan's first scrape with the devil. The next symbol down the right-hand side of the cake is a one-room schoolhouse. And that's to remind us that while Dan and his older brother attended a one-room country schoolhouse, uh, up to the third grade, their frail and by this time their dying father supplemented his son's learning by reading them the classics by lamplight. Of course, from their mother, the boys learned to face adversity with stoic determination. Now, when Dan was eight years of age, the Smoot family left their farm and moved to Denver for his father's health. The family land was lost in the First Depression backwash of World War I. They also lost their grandfather. Dan and his brother sold newspapers on the streets of Denver to supplement his mother's meager earnings. But before Dan was 10 years old, both of his parents died. Now, through circumstances and a tremendous will for independence, Dan Smoot left school with a third grade education and he began to earn his own living entirely on his own at the age of 10. Now, the kind of work he did, well, it can all be found in the Dan Smoot story. If you don't have that, you ought to get it and read it. Just to give you an idea, he chopped cotton in Arkansas, he mined coal in Southern Illinois, he rode fence in Nebraska, <laughs> and he stirred mash at a Kentucky moonshine still. <laughs> so you see, he really did, he really did need one more hour on his knees. <laughs> and there's some other things we were told he did, but he asked us not to mention them, so you'll have to talk to him about it. Further down the cake, you'll find a, a miniature form of a freight train, and that's to remind us that in the middle of the Depressions, in the 1930s, at the age of 17 now, Dan Smoot rode into Dallas on a freight train, and I've never ridden a freight train, but I've been told that if you try to ride a freight train, since they don't have seats, and since the, uh, uh, the engineers and those who attend the freight trains don't uh, exactly smile on the free ride, you have to wait till the train starts to move, and then you run and jump on it and crawl underneath it and, strung, and string your body over the, the metal rods that are underneath the boxcars to keep the boxcars from sagging. And of course, that's why they call it riding the rods. So I can assume that Dan was riding the rods at the age of 17. He rode into Dallas on a freight train with a dollar and 25 cents in his pocket. Now, he used, it says here, he used the 25 cents to take a bath. Now, <laughs> now, after riding the rails, I suppose uh, you'd really need it. Dan said he really needed it, but still, 25 cents in the Depression days would have bought an awful lot of bath. He had a dollar left over, and he used that to live on until he secured full-time employment at a produce house working 12 hours a day, a minimum of 12 hours a day, six days a week for about $9 a week or $40 a month. Now, he has a lot of comments in the Dan Smoot story about his first employer, uh, Tom Ransom. But uh, that leads us to the next symbol on the cake, which is a small miniature bag of potatoes, a 100-pound bag of potatoes. And that's to remind us that this job for the first several months in Dallas was unloading 100-pound sacks of potatoes from freight cars. 
It's interesting to know that at that time, the 17-year-old Dan Smoot weighed 125 pounds. Years later, his employer uh, told, uh, his name was Tom Ransom, uh, told Mrs. Smoot all about hiring him. And uh, these, these are the words that his employer used to describe uh, that particular event. He said, for three straight mornings, when I got to the office at 6 a.m., there he stood, looking eager and asking for a job. I knew he wouldn't take a handout, and he didn't look strong enough to do any of the kind of work I could give him. So in the end, I gave him a job just to get rid of him. I thought he'd last about two hours, but I was wrong. I had never seen anything like him before, and I don't think I ever will again. And I'm sure there's a prettier word, but in my book, he said, He's got the kind of guts that real men are made of. Now on the third tier down, can't see which side, I guess it's still on the right side of the cake, there is a 50 cent piece. It's a Franklin 50 cent piece, which means it's got some silver in it. <laughs> and on top of the 50 cent piece there's the symbol of a bride and a groom now that's quite a story and I better not get it wrong but it says here that 1931 we found Dan Smoot going back to school he entered high school as a sophomore with only a third grade official education I imagine he got quite an education outside of school but he went back to high school as a sophomore in 1931. Meanwhile, at night, he was driving a produce truck to the East Texas oil fields and back. Now, here again, I'd like to quote something. These are the words of Mrs. Smoot speaking. As one of his classmates, I recall he was the most silent and the smartest student in school. Sometimes he'd fall asleep in class from exhaustion the teachers never awakened him. We girls were annoyed because he never looked at any of us. I doubt that, but that's what she said. <laughs> anyway, that's what she thought, and she goes on, she says, I finally bet a friend 50 cents that I could get him to ask me for a date before the term was over. It wasn't easy, she says, but I won the bet. I never let my friend know that he forgot to show up for the date. <laughs> she continues, she says, I vowed I'd never speak to him again, and I married him two years later. Now, that's a good lesson for you girls that are looking for husbands. Don't talk so much. Just, I, that was the wrong thing to say, I know. I could just tell it. <laughs> I won't be back next year as your cake reader, I can tell you. <laughs> Mrs. Smoot continues, she says, I was 16 when he proposed. And she said, I told him that we could be engaged, but I wouldn't marry him until he had obtained my mother's consent and blessing. And knowing my mother's ideas about teenage marriages, I thought this would take about three years. And then she says he accomplished it in one month. <laughs> but the kicker is that not only did he get the mother to consent, but Dan Smoot borrowed $10 from the mother in order to help finance the one-week honeymoon. <laughs> I'm told that uh, his mother-in-law is still trying to figure out how she was talked out of the $10. <laughs> we move then to the next symbol on the, your left side here of the cake, and there is a wrestling ring. And that's to remind us that while in high school, where Dan's grade average was in excess of a 98-point average, and while holding down a full-time job at night, Dan found the time to become the lightweight amateur wrestling champion of Dallas. 
And uh, I'm told here, too, that he wore a size 16 shirt and had a 25-inch waistline at that time. Now, I don't know why Mrs. Smoot put that down here. That wouldn't be important. You know? <laughs> he retired. This is the important thing. Dan Smoot retired undefeated as the champion at age 21. And in my book, he still remains the undefeated champion today. <laughs> on the bottom tier, on your left, there is a symbol of the atom. And that is to remind us that during Dan Smoot's valedictory address in 1934, he spoke of the coming atomic age. He described the splitting of the atom and the ultimate uses of atomic energy, some of which are now, 35 years later, still in the experimental stage. He received three separate college scholarships on graduation night and accepted the one from Southern Methodist University. Now, if you move up the cake, you'll find a small collection of books. And on the top book, it says the, uh, the volumes of Shakespeare. And there was supposed to be an overcoat flying away, but the overcoat, I guess, has flown. We don't see it there. And here, he knows what's coming already. <laughs> All through Dan's freshman year at college, Mrs. Smoot says that she worried because he didn't have an overcoat. And I guess it didn't worry Dan too much because he had never had an overcoat. But Mrs. Smoot decided that he should have one, and she saved her coins for a long time until finally she had $25 set aside for a brand new overcoat. And in the 30s, during the Depression, $25 buy an awful lot of overcoat. And so she waited until she found just the right one on sale. She clipped out the picture and the description of the overcoat and gave it to Dan, gave him the $25 and said, here's my present, honey, go get the overcoat. So Dan left and she waited and waited anxiously for him to return with this beautiful overcoat. And you know what he came back with? 25 volumes of Shakespeare because he just happened to see these books on sale in a bookstore as he walked by. <laughs> well, I got it wrong. There were only 12 volumes. It did cost $25. But you know, I'll bet there was a tempest in a teapot there that night. <laughs> well, we move up the cake. And there is a figure of a graduate, and across the front of the graduate, it says Harvard. And that's to remind us that after high school, uh, Dan Smoot went on to earn his Bachelor of Arts degree and his master's degree at Southern Methodist University. And while working for his master degree at uh, Southern Methodist and holding down a full-time job, he also taught a college credit class in Shakespeare, naturally, not in overcoats, <laughs> three nights a week, and these were to uh, uh, students who were themselves going to be teachers. He received a teaching fellowship at Harvard, where he started working on his PhD in American civilization. And then, of course, the war broke out, and... Uh, Dan Smoot had a little trouble getting into the military service. I had some facts here about uh, colorblindness, and I, I guess I'm not supposed to tell you about it because it's been crossed out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, apparently uh, Dan couldn't get into the uh, military because, you know, you have to be able to distinguish colors, and, uh, and he couldn't pass the test very well. Finally, he uh, wound up uh, getting hold of the charts and memorizing the various positions of the letters and the color figurations, and I guess this helped somewhat. Anyway, Dan finally wound up squeaking by some of the examinations and went into the FBI. And that, of course, is the reason we find the FBI shield here, because we know, most of us here know, that Dan Smoot was, uh, he left Harvard to join the FBI immediately after Pearl Harbor, and he rose to the position of assistant to Director J. Edgar Hoover. Now, among the men who worked with him, and by the way, there's something else here you should know. Uh, this is an aside that's been crossed out also. Dan said that uh, for years while he was with the FBI, he 
He was afraid that someday he would be given an assignment to pick up someone wearing a gray hat, a brown suit, and a green tie because he couldn't tell one color from the other. (laughs) But among the men who worked with Dan at the FBI, he became something of a legend there, but he never discusses the truly important work that he did in the field of national security. Now we move to a next symbol here on the cake. It's a, it's a microphone, and it says TV in front of it to indicate that Dan, as we know, has done much work in the field of television and radio. When he started the Dan Smoot Report in 1955, he made himself two promises. One, an independent dedication to the preservation of constitutional government. And two, a promise to himself that if he ever compromised this principle... He would quit. Of course, he'll never have to quit. You can be sure of that. Now, that moves us to another symbol on the cake, which is of a bicycle. And that's to remind us that Dan has some hobbies. He never had an opportunity to ride a bicycle until he was about 25 years of age. But in recent years, he's become a bicycling enthusiast. Now, he rides on an average of 20 miles a day, usually before breakfast, And last year, he took his bicycle to Mississippi by plane. Sounds a little eccentric, but he did it. (laughs) And he rode this bicycle 125 miles in less than four days, inspecting the Natchez Trace. Dan relaxes with uh, good, sturdy exercise. Recently, before 9.30 in the morning, before 9.30 in the morning, on a Saturday, he'd taken a 20-mile bicycle ride He'd ridden his horse for an hour. He swam for 30 minutes and played two sets of tennis. I'm not going to question any about the the waist size size today, but I bet it's not much more than 25 inches. Now, if you move up the cake, you'll find two Confederate soldiers there, and that's to tell us that Dan Smoot has become what you might call a Civil War buff. Uh, he's, uh, He's really a student of the subject. To date, he has walked several hundred miles touring the battlefield on foot, various battlefields. And I'm told he annoys the professional, uh, guides who tell the, uh, the tourists what's going on because he often has to correct their statistics and their information. (laughs) And uh, I'm told that he usually is reading about three books at a time on the war. And I guess he really could tell you something about it. Now, the last symbol that I'm going to describe is at the top of your left side of the cake there. And we see two books, the titles of which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And that is The Hope of the World and The Invisible Government, two of the most outstanding books you ever hope to read, written by Dan Smoot. Now, of course, all of this on the cake and all the brief history that has been given to me doesn't tell you the whole story of Dan Smoot. And I don't think we'll ever know, really, all there is to know, all we should know, because Dan is, is a very modest man, and many things he just would not want you to know. But those who know him best, his family, just observe what they think of your Dan Smoot, and you can tell what kind of a man he is. And I'm told that to the members of his family, to them only, not really for public consumption, but here is something... I hope Dan doesn't mind my repeating. To members of his family, here is what Dan Smoot has said. I always felt I owed this country something. Possibly, possibly I love it more than other men do. Because only here could I have inherited the freedom to become whatever I was capable of being. And no man has a right to ask for more. And that, ladies and gentlemen, in a phrase, symbolizes, I think, the man of courage and the son of liberty that we honor here tonight, Dan Smoot.